Hi everyone, today I'm going to continue the story of Christy Tanks in the USSR. Uh, in a previous video you saw how uh, Christy Tanks were purchased and how they went from uh, the Model 1928 to the BT-2 tank which was accepted in service uh, in the Red Army. Now, even though the BT-2 was improved compared to the original Christie prototypes, uh, it still wasn't entirely satisfactory for service. Uh, and so development of a new and improved tank began almost immediately. Uh, this tank was known as the BT-5. So the biggest change to the BT-5 that you can see immediately is the turret. Uh, the BT-5 received a cylindrical turret with a turret bustle. Uh, at first this was just uh, more ammunition storage that was bolted on to the back, but later on it received a larger and sleeker bustle, which finally allowed the tank to have a radio, unlike the BT-2, which was never built with a radio. So the BT-2 was built with a mix of armament. There was machine gun versions, uh, versions with 37mm gun, uh, various combinations of the two. Uh, the BT-5 only had a 45mm gun and a coaxial DT machine gun. Uh, interestingly enough, this configuration was copied from the Germans, uh, which tested their tanks with this sort of setup at uh, Kazan at the secret tank school. The new turret wasn't the only change made to the BT tank. Uh, due to various improvements in the drivetrain and the controls, the mobility of the tank remained the same, although its weight increased to 11.6 and later to 11.9 tons. Uh, the engine used in this tank was uh, an M5. It was a copy of the American Liberty engine, uh, and uh, the power was reduced a little bit to 365 uh, horsepower, uh, just so it'll be a little bit more reliable. The speed of the tank actually increased a little bit to 52 kilometers per hour on tracks or 72 kilometers per hour on wheels. Uh, since this speed was different, it was impossible to drive with one track uh, installed and one track removed. Mass production of the BT-5 began in 1933 and concluded in 1934, uh, but since the Soviet tank industry was getting a little bit more mature, uh, the production volume was quite impressive. There were 1,884 BT-5s built, 263 of which were uh, equipped with a radio. So like I mentioned before, the BT-5 was equipped with the M5 engine, uh, however that was still not enough for the uh, Red Army, and so trials were carried out in 1933 to equip it with a more powerful M17 engine. Uh, and the M17 used an aircraft, uh, put out 600 horsepower, which is too much for the tank's transmission, so uh, it was reduced the power to 400 horsepower, but even this gave quite good results. So the BT tank with a, this new engine got a new index, it was called BT-7. Uh, now, the engine wasn't the only thing that changed. Uh, most notably, the front of the tank was no longer riveted. It was now welded. Uh, its shape changed uh, a little bit quite uh, as well. Uh, and there was a muffler in the back that was no longer installed. Uh, there was another very small change where the diameter of the road wheels increased from 815 millimeters to 830 millimeters. The BT-7 continued to change throughout its uh, lifespan. For example, when it was introduced, it had a cylindrical turret like this. Uh, but in 1937, it received a conical turret like this, where the sloped sides offered increased protection, even though it didn't really have thicker armor than its predecessor. In 1936, uh, also this little thing was introduced. This is the P-40 mount for the TT-29 machine gun, uh, which allowed the tank to fight aircraft. So the mass of the BT-7 tank with the conical turret increased to 13.9 tons, uh, but the increased horsepower of the engine actually kept its mobility at the same place as its predecessor, 52 kilometers per hour on wheels, sorry, on tracks, and 72 kilometers per hour on wheels. Okay, uh, here is a closer look at the two BT tanks that I have in my possession. Uh, these are both BT-7 tanks, but one represents a later production tank and one represents an initial production tank. So uh, over here, uh, you see the cylindrical turret that was used on T-26 tanks, uh, on BT-5 tanks, and on earlier BT-7 tanks. Over here, uh, you see the conical turret that was introduced in 1937 and the uh, anti-aircraft machine gun mount that was introduced in 1936. 
So the uh, probably the largest uh, difference aside from the shape of the turret you'll see are the hatches. Uh, the hatches on the BT-7 are rectangular. The hatches uh, on the uh, Model 1937 BT-7 uh, are well, they're different. Uh, the hatch on the left here is oval. Uh, this hatch was used on um, tanks without this anti-aircraft gun mount. Um, and the hatch with the gun mount here is round. Uh, that is to allow the uh, anti-aircraft machine gun to move around uh, to fire at airborne targets. Um, if it did not have this kind of machine gun, both hatches would be uh, exactly identical to this one. Another difference on the back here you can see is that this tank has a machine gun ball. The idea was that uh, in close quarters you would take off the machine gun uh, since you wouldn't be able to peek out and fire uh, anyway, uh, and you would put it into this mount in the back and fire anybody behind your tank. The BT-7, the earlier type, does not have this feature. Uh, it has a hatch back here which can be used for evacuation or for loading ammo. Um, and there's a pistol port in the middle. You can also fire through it with your uh, Nagan revolver or TT pistol. In photos, you can see uh, tanks without an AA machine gun with a rear machine gun port, and you can see tanks with an AA machine gun with a rear, rear pistol port. Um, so it seems that there was not really any kind of rule about this. Uh, and if you're building a model tank, you can do uh, one or the other. Uh, another difference between these two tanks is the periscope. So see, this tank here only has a gunner's periscope uh, and the opening for a loader's periscope is covered up with a shutter. Uh, that is because this is a, just a regular tank. Um, even though this kit includes a rail antenna, uh, it does not have a port for said antenna on top of the turret. So that should really be there. On the other hand, this tank has two periscopes, uh, which means both the loader and the commander can observe. Uh, this was usually a feature uh, found only on commander's tanks. Uh, however, rank and file tanks would often have a fake periscope to confuse the enemy. One question I'm often asked about the BT tanks is, how do I tell the difference between a BT-5 and a BT-7? And indeed, it is quite difficult uh, from a distance, especially if you don't see a conical turret. But as long as you can see the front of the tank or the rear of the tank, you can tell the difference. So one of the most noticeable parts is the center uh, where the upper armor and the lower armor intersect. Uh, so on the BT-5, there is actually a little rectangle there where the sides meet, uh, the, uh, the top and the bottom uh, all kind of converge. Uh, and you can see the rivets that hold it all together. On the BT-7, uh, the this part of the front is curved, uh, and you can see, if you get close enough, you can see the welding seams. Another uh, telltale sign, if you're looking from the front, is the driver's cabin. Uh, the BT-5, the driver sits in a sort of uh, very constrained, um, very constrained cabin, where the to his left and to his right, the upper front plate continues at a slope. Uh, on the BT-7, the driver's cabin has been expanded to fill the entire width of the tank, uh, and there is no longer any kind of discrete cabin. From the back, uh, it's actually much easier. Uh, on the BT-2 and the BT-5 tank, there is a very large muffler where the exhaust is vented into. Uh, and on the BT-7 tank, there is no muffler. Uh, now, on some BT-5 tanks, the muffler has actually been removed, and there are just two exhaust pipes similar to what the BT-7 has. But you can still see the shelf where the muffler used to go, as well as the two openings for the exhaust that have now been welded over. Now, this tank is often criticized for the configuration of its crew. Uh, so you have the gunner, uh, who also serves as the commander, uh, and the loader separately in the turret. And of course, the commander has to service the gun as well as uh, command his tank, or if he's the commander of a platoon or a company, the rest of his unit. Uh, this criticism is, well, it's reasonable. However, at the time, most light tanks had either uh, two man crews in the turret or just even one. For example, the British uh, in 1934 introduced the light tank Mark IV. The light tank Mark IV only had one crewman in the turret. The light tank Mark VI with two crewmen in the turret was only introduced in 1936. 
Poland was in a similar situation uh, until 1935. They used Vickers Mark E tanks. Uh, these tanks had two turrets with one person apiece. So even though there were two other people in the tank aside from the driver, the commander still had to load his machine gun. The United States was more or less in a similar boat uh, where the light tank M2 also had two turrets with one person in each of them. The French, of course, are famous for having very large tanks with one-man turrets. Uh, the, of course, the, the light tanks, uh, the Hotchkiss and the Renault 35, uh, they both had only two crewmen, uh, one driver and one gunner, loader, commander. Um, and the Somo uh, medium tank or armored car, according to the French uh, classification system, it also had only one person in the turret. The German Panzerkampfwagen I uh, was in a similar boat. Uh, it was only introduced in 1934, but it had one driver and one commander slash gunner slash loader who had to service not one, but two machine guns. Similarly, the Panzerkampfwagen II, introduced in 1936, also only had one person in the turret who had to service the auto cannon and the machine gun. The Italians were in an even stranger boat. Uh, their Ansaldo 5T tank, that uh, was introduced in 1936, had one crewman in the turret who was operating both machine guns, but he also had a cannon in the hull that he also had to use. So, uh, as you can see, when compared to its contemporaries, uh, other light tanks used by major tank building nations at the time, the BT-5 actually had a pretty progressive setup for its turret crew. The BT-7 was actually a pretty good tank for its time, and you can see that by its service record. Uh, when it, after it being introduced in 1934, it remained in production until 1939. During this time, 2,596 tanks without a radio and 2,017 tanks with a radio were built. The BT-7 continued to fight throughout the entire Great Patriotic War and finished its combat career in August of 1945, fighting against the Japanese in Manchuria.